last fourth party of the training week. So that is going to tell us about the mock stuff, another type of mock strategy. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for uh, inviting me here to speak. So I will, I will talk about mock modularity. Uh, but I think I will introduce mock modularity properly, <laughs> like in the second lecture, something like that. So most of this, so the, the, the focus, I think, of my lectures was, will be mostly on uh, moonshine and relations between uh, modular stuff and uh, string theory through this moonshine, and then I will uh, go through also the mock modular forms uh, and related stuff. So, uh, so what is moonshine, just to start? So moonshine is some weird relationship between some kind of modular uh, forms or objects or other things, so some modular stuff, okay. Uh, so there is some modular stuff and then people realize that there is some weird relation between this modular stuff and some group theory, so some finite groups, so, okay. So here we have some strange observations that we cannot quite explain. And so the first instance of this kind of uh, connection has been developed in the 70s and 80s and uh, is quite famous and goes under the name of uh, monstrous moonshine. And the reason why this is interesting is that, at least with the experience with the monstrous moonshine, is that uh, in trying to explain this strange relationship here, uh, what people did is they started to develop uh, a lot of new um, topics in uh, Two-dimensional conformal field theory in string theory. This is for what uh, what physicists are more interested in, but also in algebra. Okay. And then various other developments, of course, in the uh, realm of number theory and group theory. So the idea is that in trying to explain this connection between modular stuff and, and group, people were led to try to um, develop all these things. And so this led to an, uh, a new, really new areas of mathematics, such as, for example, uh, vertex operator algebra that was developed really in, in trying to explain uh, these things among the, other, among the other things, okay? So this was the monstrous motion. And then more recently, there has been uh, similar observations of strange connection with the modular stuff and, and group theory in the last, like, say, 15 years. Okay, and the hope is that uh, in trying to explain this kind of connection, we are led to discover new, uh, if you want, exceptional structures in conformal field theory, string theory, and maybe in algebra and in other uh, areas, for example, geometry might play a role here. So the truth is that uh, these new moonshine observations have not been explained <laughs> yet. Okay, but at least we were able to develop many new results in this area, so it was useful anyway, and uh, the other nice thing is that there is still room to work here because there are a lot of things that are uh, unexplained, okay? So my plan for these lectures is to uh, give a short introduction to moonshine, and in particular the old monstrous moonshine. Then I will talk about two-dimensional conformal field theory. So uh, I think that most of you have some working knowledge of two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, I will, anyway, try to sketch, maybe quickly, the main features of two-dimensional conformal field theory that we will need to, to explain this stuff. So uh, this is to, I will try to keep the lectures like self-contained and not boring. So I, I will probably fail both ways, but I, I will try anyway. And then I will introduce some more modular stuff. So this will be like classical modular stuff. So a little, let's say, a little extension of what um, Oliver told us yesterday. And this will be sufficient to explain the old, at least some part of the old moonshine, not everything, but at least a good, a, a good chunk of it. And then we will switch gear, and we will go to more fancy modular stuff. Well, first of all, Jacobi forms, which are not so fancy, but then also mock modular forms, okay? And from on the CFT side, I will mostly talk about um, some super 
conformal field theories. In particular, we'll focus on uh, supersymmetric sigma models on K3 surfaces, which are more or less the realm where it's easier to uh, formulate the new moonshine conjectures. Okay. So I should put the new in commas because it's getting old by now. So this is later than 2001. 2010. So my, so I think a, a, a reasonable definition is after 2008, things are new, and before 2008, things are old. That's my. So 2008 is when I got my PhD. So that, so that's maybe not universal definition. But. And then, in the end, I will try to go a bit beyond conformal field theory and look at string theory. And this will tell us something more about even the old moonshine conjectures. And I will see, I will get you to the relation between string theory and some other algebraic kind of uh, structure, which are uh, borges Katzmodi algebras. Okay, so this is this slightly. Okay, I don't know how much time I will have to explain this, but I will try to do that. So let's say these are first, uh, second lectures till here, then third lecture till here, and maybe I will try to do the fourth lecture. Okay, so let me just mention that there are some, some other connection of moonshine with some other stories in, in physics, which might be interesting, but I will not talk about. Uh, for example, uh, there's a nice relationship with black hole counting, fu my counting functions. So the functions counting microstates in supersymmetric black holes, which are closely related to K3 compatification of string theory. So this is very nice and very important. Uh, and I thought about <laughs> talking about this, but I, I need too much background. I will, not, I will not make it, so I decided to. To cut it out. So, but this is this is very nice. So uh, there is a, a many reviews. So if you are interested in the topic, that's that's something to to do. Okay. So just a couple of references for what I will talk about. So about moonshine. So about the old moonshine. So there are a lot of reviews. Okay. Uh, but I would suggest Terry Gannon's book about the old moonshine, where everything is explained up to the. I mean up to the year where, <laughs> where the thing was published. So, but a lot of it was explained. And then I, there are many reviews on the new moonshines. So this is a book, which is called probably Moonshine, simply, or something like that. And I will base a bit my lectures on some notes by Vasilis Anagianis and Miranda Chang for what concerns the new moonshines. And this is like 1807, uh, 007, okay. But there are many more reviews. So what is this monstrous moonshine? So let's start from what uh, Oli told us yesterday. So uh, we have the upper half plane. And then we have this group, SL to Z, that that's on the upper half plane. So this is the group of matrices A, B, C, D, with A, B, C, D integers, and uh, the terminant one. And this acts on the upper half plane by uh, fractional linear transformations. So we want to uh, we want to take some function, some modular function, if you some modular form. So some function f from the upper half plane to c. I want to take it holomorphic, and let me take it, say, invariant under SL to Z transformation. So it f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d, I want it to be equal to f of tau. So this would be a modular form of weight zero. Modular form of weight 
k equals zero, according to yesterday's definition of Olio, or if you want a modular function. This is modular form, so weight zero according to modular functions. Okay, so uh, you can look at this as a function, if you want, from uh, the quotient. So let me call, for the moment being, let me call a gamma this is cell to z, okay? And I will change the definition of gammas, but for the moment, gamma is just a cell to z. So you can look at this as a, at this kind of function, as a function from this quotient into c, okay? And how does this quotient look like? Well, yesterday, Oli drew, drew this nice keyhole shape, so the fundamental domain of this action, so this is minus a half, this is a half, and then you can think of this guy as being parameterized by this fundamental domain where you have to identify these two sides because this is given by tau goes to tau plus one. And then uh, you also have to identify this arc oriented like this with this arc oriented like this, like reflecting through uh, this point, which is I. So essentially, so you have a cylinder and then you zip it up. <laughs> downstairs, okay? You close it like this. So this is essentially this, this quotient here. So uh, Oli yesterday told us that it is important when you define these kind of functions to specify what happens at the cusp, at infinity, right? So we know that uh, we can compatify this quotient, h mod gamma, can be compatified by adding one point, you have this thing and you add one point at I infinity, let's say. There's a, another way to, to write this compatification. You can think of taking the upper half plane and joining the point at infinity and all the rational points on the real axis. Okay? And then afterwards, you quotient by your result to Z. And this is the same thing. The reason why this is the same thing is that uh, using a, a cell to z transformation, you can map I infinity to any rational point. So this is A over C. And essentially, any rational point can be obtained in this way from I infinity. So what this means is that this set forms a, a, a single orbit under a cell to z. So when you take the quotient of this by gamma, you just get a single a single point, that, and you can take uh, I infinity as a representative of this orbit. So this is more useful when you use groups that are different from a cell to Z, okay? So, as Oli said, if you require your function to be holomorphic both in H and at I infinity, then uh, you don't find much, okay? So essentially, you just get constants. And that's very, it's kind of obvious because uh, in this case you have this compactification is a compact Riemann surface. In this case it's a sphere, okay? And then every holomorphic function on a compact Riemann surface uh, by Liouville theorem is, is a constant, okay? So you, not, you have to allow for uh, either some weight, okay, but I don't want to do that, or some pole somewhere. So the mildest thing that you can think about is the, just to put poles at, uh, at the cusp at I infinity, okay? So these are what are called, uh, these are, if you want, a kind of meromorphic modular forms, but they are a special kind of meromorphic modular form which are called weakly holomorphic modular forms or modular functions, I mean, what you're talking about. So this means that you allow you allow poles, but only, only at I infinity, and not uh, inside your upper half plane. Okay. So if you have such, so this means that now your function is not a function into C, but it's a function in, into C uh, and infinity, and this is and this is the Riemann sphere. Okay. So you can try the simplest thing here. Okay. The simplest thing is to have just one single pole at infinity, okay? So a good coordinate at infinity is given by Q, 
okay? Q is always into the 2 pi i tau, and this is a, a, local, a good local coordinate in this compatification near, near infinity. So having a pole at i infinity means having a pole as Q goes to zero, okay? So the easiest function you can write, let's call it for example j of tau, okay, is to have just one single pole at infinity. I can pick up the coefficient one. Then I can always add a constant to this, to this coefficient. So okay, let me stress. Uh, as Oliver stressed yesterday, uh, because the sl 2 z group has a, a, a transformation, which is tau goes to tau plus one, Then we have a Fourier expansion in e to the 2 pi i tau, so we can expand any modular functions in power of q. Okay, so we have just a q to the minus one as a single pole. The constant, so the q to the zero term, you can put to zero by adding a constant if we need. And then we have the rest of the q expansion of our function. Okay, so now we have this j, which is a holomorphic function from uh, this space to this space. Okay, and it is actually not just holomorphic, it is a one-to-one -one function, okay. And in fact, it is bi-holomorphic. Okay, this comes from the fact that if you want the pre-image of infinity, it's just, it's just a one single point. So it has degree one, if you want, and this implies that it is one-to-one -one on every point, okay? This, is, this comes from complex analysis, essentially. So this is a biholomorphic function from D space to D space. So is it surprising that we have this biholomorphic function? And the answer is no, okay? Because uh, by Riemann uniformization theorem, we know that every complex one-dimensional manifold which has a topology of a sphere, that's biholomorphic to the, to the Riemann sphere, okay? So it is kind of an obvious thing once you accept a completely non-obvious theorem, okay? So, and so once you notice that this is a topology of a sphere, so this is this quotient as genus zero, then there must be a function like this, okay? A biolomorphic function like this. And then you can choose to have, uh, you have some freedom in choosing this biolomorphic function. You can use this freedom to say that the point at infinity is the image of the point at infinity here. Then you can use the rescaling to say that this is one, and then some more freedom to say, to add a constant to say that this constant term is zero. Okay. So once you fix these things, then you fix your, uh, your function here, okay? So this exists just because this is a genus zero Riemann surface, okay? So essentially what it tells you is that it gives you a map from, from the coordinate tau Okay, to the coordinate z that you want to call maybe the coordinate of this Riemann surface, which is essentially j of tau. Okay, and then gives you a bit more because um, we know that any meromorphic function on the Riemann sphere, you can write it as uh, a rational function in the coordinate z, so polynomial over polynomial, and this tells you that every um, meromorphic function on this space is simply given by p of j of tau over q of j of tau, okay? Just because z is j of tau. And meromorphic functions in this space are essentially meromorphic modular functions or meromorphic modular forms of genus zero. So this tells you that all meromorphic modular form of genus zero, of weight zero, sorry, all meromorphic modular forms of weight zero are rational functions in this, in this j function. Okay, so this is, if you want, the whole story when it comes to a cell to z. Uh, okay, there is one function and that's it. But you can get more examples of this if you change your group, okay? So instead of a cell to z, you can change some subgroups of a cell to z, for example. And there are some nice, interesting subgroups of a cell to z that appear in conformal theory, string theory, etc. So just to make a bit of examples of subgroups of a cell to Z. So gamma N is the group of 
a cell to Z elements where A and D, so the diagonal elements are congruent to one, mod n, and the off-diagonal elements are multiples of n. Okay. This means that mod n, if you take this integer matrix mod n, this is just the identity matrix. So this is called the principal congruent subgroup. Principal congruence subgroup. And this is, and the N is the level. Okay. And then you have some more groups. So in general, when you talk about congruent subgroups, uh, so you're talking about subgroups of a cell to C, uh, which contain, which contain some gamma N. Um, for some level n. Okay, so these are congruent subgroups. So some nice congruent subgroups are gamma zero n, which will appear even later. Gamma zero n are given by a, b, c, d, in the cell to z, such that, and here we only require c to be zero, mod n, okay? So just this entry to be a multiple of n. And then you have, for example, gamma one, and which is A, B, C, D, when you require uh, A and D to be one, and C to be zero, but you don't put any uh, requirements on, on uh, B, okay? So, uh, these two groups have tau goes to tau plus one transformation, the T transformation, which means that any modular form, which is modular under this gamma zero N or this gamma one N, you can expand it in powers of Q, which is E to the two pi I tau. This gamma N doesn't have this, this transformation, okay? The best that it has is tau goes to tau plus N, Okay, which means that modular forms for gamma n, uh, you need to expand in Q with power, uh, some power over n. Okay, in powers of Q or one over n. But okay, that's not too, that's not too terrible, okay? Okay, good, so the thing is, every time you have a group like this, for example, a congruent subgroup, so gamma now is a congruent subgroup, you can, get the compatification in this way, okay? By taking, you add the point at infinity or rational numbers, and you divide by gamma. So what will happen now if you have a congruent subgroup and not a cell to Z is that you don't have a single orbit of this uh, uh, in the action on this set, but you have, if you have a con congruent subgroup, you have finitely many orbits, which means that instead of adding a single point here, you need to add uh, one point for each orbit. So you, in general, what you add is the point at high infinity and then some rational numbers that you can choose because you can choose the representative. Uh, you have to choose one representative for each of these orbits, okay? So you have different cusps, okay? And then you can look for um, functions which are holomorphic, for example, inside the upper half plane and have maybe some poles at the cusps. So you have different poles are different cusps, okay? And if you take this quotient, what you get compatified, you get a, a closed Riemann surface which can have different genera, so different topology now, okay? So in some cases, this will be genus zero, okay? In other cases, it will be genus one, two, three, et cetera, okay? So if it is genus zero, then you know that you have a map like this. Okay, you have a holomorphic map from here to the Riemann sphere, and you can choose it to have uh, just one single pole just as the, at the cusp at infinity and no other cusps, okay? So in general, if you have gamma some subgroup of this kind, then you have a function. So let me call it T in general. So this is a biolomorphic function here. It starts... So let's say that Q is a good coordinate, so you have 
for example, groups of this kind. So Q is a go good coordinate near infinity. So it starts just with Q to the minus one. Okay. Then you can always add a constant to get the zero here. And then you will get whatever it is as the rest of the Q expansion. Okay. So for every gamma such that this is genus zero, you have such a function. And then all meromorphic functions on this space will be given by polynomials in this function. Okay. So this function here is called the uh, Hout, the principal modulus in, Engli in English, or the Hout module for the group gamma, which is a subgroup of a Z. Okay, for the moment, and and it, this just makes sense. It just exists if uh, the quotient, this quotient is genus zero. It's a genus zero surface. If this is not a genus zero surface, you cannot have a bilomorphic map to the Riemann sphere, of course. So you, you need to have more poles, for example. Okay. That's what happens, essentially. Right. Okay. Sometimes you might want to have even more general groups than this. You might even want to go outside the sal 2 z For example, you can take groups like this. Take p a prime, a prime number, and then you have a group gamma 0 p plus, okay, which is essentially gamma 0 p, but then you add some, some other elements, which are of the form uh, minus one over square root of p, square root of p zero zero, times any element in gamma zero p. Okay, so one can check. So this is not in a cell to z. Okay, it's in a cell to r. It's still determinant one, but it's not. They're not integral. And uh, one can check that if you multiply any element. So this is given by multiplying this guy by any element here, and you can check that if you multiply two elements here inside you get something here, so the group, the group closes. Okay, so that's, that's really a group. So these kind of guys are called uh, Fricke involutions. Fricke involutions. Okay. And this, just to anticipate something, so this is a subgroup of a cell to R, in general, not of a cell to Z. So a cell to R preserves the upper half plane by uh, fractional linear transformations. You have to be careful that in general SL2R doesn't <laughs> preserve this set, so they have to be a bit special groups of SL2R. Uh, in this case it works, but essentially because this is a rescaling by a real number of something integral. Uh, if you rescale by square root of p, you get something integral. And the rescaling doesn't matter when you do fractional linear transformations, okay? So essentially you can replace this by a, an integral matrix with the determinant di different from one, and then you get the uh, rational sign infinity are mapped into themselves. So this, this works in this case. Okay. Now, if you are, uh, so just to anticipate, these kind of groups, which are subgroups of a cell to R and not of a cell to Z, uh, essentially, as far as I know, never appear in conformal field theory, okay? People tried <laughs> to make them appear, but, uh, failed, and, but they are important for moonshine, okay? And they do appear in string theory in some cases. So that's where you need to go beyond conformal field theory to get this kind of groups. You get anything beyond conformal Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, right, right, right. So that's, that's uh, yeah. This is like, I think, Wafa in, yeah, long ago that did this. Uh, but if you take CHL models with orbifolds of order, take order 11, good, you have uh, freaking evolution with order 11 stuff. Yeah, for example.
Uh, I liked, <laughs> I like 11. <laughs> so, uh, gamma node of 11 is the first, is the first number where this is not genus zero. Okay. But, but then if you, if you add this guy, then it becomes genus zero. Okay. So gamma node of 11 is genus one. And, and gamma node 11 plus is genus zero. So if you, are, if you are a string theorist, then you ask questions like, where do these groups appear in string amplitudes, for example, <laughs> okay, or in S duality, right? But if you are a mathematician, you ask all different questions. So the different questions you can ask are, uh, for which primes P is uh, gamma zero P plus uh, genus zero? And in this case, you know that you have a, a, a how module for this, for this group. So now, this question was asked by Og in 75, 1975. Okay. And he answered his own question. Uh, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, I will always say, yeah, right. Uh, H mod gamma zero P is genus zero, and for short, I will always say the group is genus zero. But what I really mean is H mod gamma zero P compatified is a, is a sphere, is a genus zero. Okay, this is what, what I mean. So he made a list of primes, which include two, three, five, all primes till 31, okay? And then 41, 47, 59, 71, and the list stops here, okay? So these are the only primes where gamma zero P plus is genus zero. If you go with other primes, then it's higher genus. So what this tells you is that genus zero groups are rare, okay? They're not so many, and in fact, you can check that in a sense there are finitely many genus zero groups, okay? if you put some constraints. I mean, I, I'm looking at the cell to R group, so you have to put some constraints, but uh, essentially there are finitely many genus zero groups. So that, these are rare beasts, right? Okay, so this is the modular stuff part that I wanted to tell you. And around the same time, people in Mathematicians working in group theory were trying to do something big, like from the maybe 50s, 60s, till the 80s, were trying to do a classification. Classification of finite simple groups. Okay, so just to fix a bit terminology. So simple groups are groups that uh, have no normal subgroup, non-trivial normal subgroup, okay? So if G is a group, then if you have N and uh, a subgroup of G, uh, this is normal. If, uh, if you take any element of the subgroup and every element of the bigger group, then the conjugation the conjugate element uh, stays in the norm, in the, in the group N. So conjugation by an ele element of G doesn't bring you out of the group N, but just moves you inside this group. So this is a normal subgroup. And the nice thing about normal subgroups is that you can take a quotient, for example, a right quotient like this, so identifying uh, elements of G mod uh, multiplication by N. And if, if this is normal, then this is, this is a group. Let's call it Q, is a group. If it is not normal, then in general this is not a group, okay? And so the idea is that if you have a big group G, you can try to understand the structure of the big group G by looking at the normal subgroups, maybe some big normal subgroups, and then taking the quotients, and then you have something uh, simpler, and then you say, okay, this big group G is given by taking the smaller group N and combining with this other group Q to get something bigger. Okay, the combining part is very non-trivial, but that's one way to, 
to, to tackle the, uh, this classification. So for example, uh, just gamma zero P plus. So gamma zero P is a normal subgroup in gamma zero P plus. Okay, and the quotient is, 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 a, is a Z2, is isomorphic to Z2. In fact, this is the largest subgroup of a SAL2R with respect to which gamma zero P is normal. That's a normalizer of gamma zero P. That's why people are interested in this kind of things. Okay. Okay, so, so the idea is that the simple groups, so a simple group is, so G is simple if the normal subgroups, the only normal subgroups are the obvious one, n equal one, so the, the group with just the identity, or n equals g, okay? These are obvious normal subgroups that every group contains, and g is simple if these are the only ones, okay? So the, the simple groups are the building blocks, building blocks of your groups, because you cannot take quotients like this, but you can use them, okay, as quotients. So you, uh, you can build, all groups by taking quotients and normal subgroups that are simple. Okay. So the classification of these groups is similar to the classification of, no, is similar to the classification of um, simple Lie algebras, if you want. So there are uh, some, inf so we know now it's, it's complete, it's been completed in the 80s, this classification, and we know that there are some uh, infinite families. So like for, for real algebras, you know that you have uh, SUN, SON, SPN, and then you have exceptional guys, so E6, E7, E8, F4, and G2, okay? And here is the same, it has some infinite set families, for example, even permutations of N objects, they're typically simple, and um, some other groups that you can build like from um, like Lie, Lie groups on finite fields. This give you finite, finite groups so that, so you have some infinite families like this. And then you have some guys which do not belong to infinite families and there are just 26 of them and they're called sporadic. And these are the really exceptional guys like E6, E7, E8, okay? And the biggest one of these guys. These people started to understand that there was a, a, a really big sporadic finite simple groups in the 70s. And they were trying to, so they called it the monster group uh, because it was big, of course, but especially because its representations were really big, okay, which is what makes it very difficult to study. I mean, if you have a huge group on a small representation, you can study as matrices. There, but if you have a huge group on which a smaller representation is huge, then it becomes really difficult. Okay, so people started to to understand that there was that such a group existed, and they were able to uh, compute the the order of this of this group. So how many elements are in this group? And if you look at how many elements you are, and you factorize into prime factors. This is something like that. So you have two to the 46, three to the 20, times five to the nine, times seven to the six, times 11 square, times 13, I hope it is cubed. And then you go on times 17, and then you go on with all primes till 31. And then you have times 41, times 47 times 59 times 71. And this is the order of the monster group, okay? Now, if you compare these guys with these guys, and if I didn't make mistakes, you see that they are exactly the same prime numbers, okay? So Og noticed this because this, this order was computed before this, this calculation, and uh, he offered a bottle of Jack Daniels to whoever could explain this coincidence here. So that's the first, if you want, weird 
observation of a connection between modular functions and, and, and finite groups. Now, there is a more famous one, which I will tell you now, which is the following. So, as I said, once you give me a cell to Z, and you notice that the cell to Z, that the upper half plane of the cell to Z is genus zero, then essentially you have fixed this J function. Okay. Just by tell me, telling me that it's Q to the minus one plus zero plus, and then whatever comes next is fixed by SL to Z invariance. So what comes next is the following stuff. So the first is the Q coefficient, which is something like this. And then, sorry, the second I cannot remember. Two, one, nine, two, one, four, nine, and this might be wrong. Three, seven, six, zero, Q squared, plus, and then you go on, and you can compute all these huge numbers here. And then people started to look at representations of the monster group, okay? And if you look at the reducible, Of M, and you look at the dimensions of this irreducible representation. Well, you have the trivial representation, of course, okay, dimension one. But then the first non trivial representation, as I said, is very big. And it has dimension 196883. Okay. And the second biggest one has dimension 219. 6876, and then you go on. Okay, there are like 194 of them, so I don't write all of them. But what you see is that this is really close to this. Okay, so if you call, if you call this representation your, this dimension R1, the dimension of the smallest, this is R2, this is R3. Okay, the dimensions of all representations, you notice that this number here is, if you want, the sum of R1 plus R2. Now, this is quite close to this, not so close, you would say, but actually, if you could look at closest, uh, if you look better, you notice that this is the sum of the first three dimensions of presentations. So if you go on, you get more complicated things, okay? But they all decompose nicely into representation of the, of the monster group. So again, people started to ask what's going on here. Okay. So the idea here, so yeah? Yeah. Yes. The series Jesus is infinite. So of course you, you have to, I mean, these are very simple, but then you repeat, you have uh, three times this representation, five times, and then, the, these numbers grow. Yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, in general, this is, this is just uh, like an observation, but you might say, okay, this is also 196884, the, the trivial representation, if you want, right? I mean, <laughs> that's not, these decompositions are not unique, of course. I mean, you just look at this decomposition. It's just that this looks really nice. Okay, for the first few coefficients. And then when you go on, they don't look nice anymore because then these numbers be become big and big and you have to sum multiple times the same representations and you don't have a, a nice decomposition anymore. Okay, but this is the sign that there is something going on. That's the point, if, if you are convinced about that. I mean, <laughs> so, so people started to look into this and the idea was the following. The idea is that uh, there is associated with this J function, there is a vector space, okay, which is given by representations of the monster group. Okay. So people called it V natural because this was the, a natural representation of the monster group. So this should decompose, so this should be an infinite dimensional vector space that decomposes into some, into many pieces graded by some n, where n, let's say, goes to minus one to infinity, and this n should correspond to this uh, exponent here. So each of these 
we are naturally finite dimensional. Okay, so, so each graded component is finite dimensional and it should be a representation of the monster group. Okay. So you can associate to this vector space, so you can interpret the J function then as something like sum from n which goes from minus one to infinity of Q to the n, the dimension of this, of the graded component. Okay. This is just a, a stupid writing and here you just try to recognize which representation is, for example, V1. So uh, the zero piece is, there is nothing. Okay, it's a zero dimensional, but then you have uh, pieces for all the other guys. And this is just a trivial representation, if one, because you have one, okay? But then if you have done this thing, then you can do something more. If there is such a vector space, and if you know what kind of representations these are of the monster group, then you can take any element of the monster, okay, and build some series, okay, we call it TG of tau attached with this, with this element simply by taking the same sum, but then instead of taking the dimensions of these representations, you take a trace of G over this representation, okay? And then you get a lot of Q series, essentially, okay? So this Q series depend only on the conjugacy class of G, okay? If you conjugate G, you get exactly the same thing. And the monster has a 194 conjugacy classes, the same number of as reducible representations as always. And actually what happens is that you only get 171 distinct functions because it happens, for example, that some conjugacy classes are like conjugate, like complex conjugate to one each other and if these are real representations that you get the same traces and then there are a few coincidences so that some guys are equal just because they're equal. So you get all these Q series, and people started to compute them by taking this as this indication seriously, and they came to this monstrous moonshine conjecture. Which tells us that there, there is V natural. So there is a vector space decomposed in this way with a, you know, a specific identification of each graded component with the representation of the monster, such that all these functions are how module for genus zero group. which I called gamma G, okay? Which in general is a subgroup of a cell to R, but usually it's mostly contained in a cell to Z. So it's things like this gamma zero P plus, where you have like one single guy outside the, uh, a cell to R that generates, generates this thing, okay? And actually you can be a bit more specific because uh, for example, if N, is the order of G, then essentially some multiple, essentially gamma zero N is contained in gamma G. You have to put probably some multiple of N. Okay, well, I, I will tell you a bit more later. But essentially gamma zero N is contained in, in this gamma G, okay? Okay, this is because um, sometimes these are modular functions with the multipliers, so they are not really invariant under gamma zero n, but they are invariant up to a phase. So if you want a really, really invariance, then you have to put slightly 
higher level. If you don't care about phases, then, you, then this is gamma zero n. Okay, so this depends on how you define things. Okay, and this is strictly related to the OG, to OGS observation because uh, if your group, if a prime number divides the order of the group, that means that there is a, a, an element of your group that has uh, that order. Okay, that's a standard group theory. And then this monstrous motion conjecture tells you that there must be a modular function for, which is a how module for, um, for the genus zero group. And in most cases, when G has prime order, the group gamma G is gamma zero P plus. Okay, so this, all these guys must be genus zero if the monstrous motion conjecture is true. Okay. Now, what is this, what is this vector space? Okay, and what is this grading, the composition? Well, this vector space, as became clear later on, is the space of states in a two-dimensional conformal field theory, okay? And a two-dimensional conformal field theory which has the monster group as its group of symmetries, okay? And this is, and this grading here is just the if you want the L0 eigenvalues of the, the decomposition into L0 eigenspaces of your two dimensional CFT. Okay. And CFT somehow explains at least part of the modularity of these trace functions, but not all of that, in particular, not this genus zero property here. So this genus zero property comes on top of the CFT. Okay. So, Uh, sorry, I'm a bit. Da, 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 11. Okay, so half an hour more. So the idea is that we have this kind of observation, okay, and this led to uh, discovering this very weird conformal field theory, and then led to much more in trying to explain the genus zero property, okay. And this was the old monstrous moonshine conjecture. And what I want to do now is to try to explain where, how you justify this thing. So this is now a theorem that it is like that. Okay, so this was, so this conjecture is due to Conway and Norton. So it's around, it's 79, I think. And there were many works. So the, the, CF, the CFT was built by mathematician, by Frankel, Leposke, Moerman in the 80s. And then the proof of the, the complete proof of the genus zero property was given by Borchards in 1991, okay, and he got the Fields Medal for this, okay. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, the new moonshines we, we haven't found, <laughs> I think, yet, so, which is embarrassing because it's maybe more time than the old monster moonshine, but yeah, you can say that that's probably more difficult or that people working on it are not good enough. But yeah, let's say that it's more difficult. <laughs> so yeah. So let's start the lectures. <laughs> let's start the lecture now. So I want to explain this thing through conformal field theory. So I go through a little bit of two-dimensional conformal field theory now. So I hope this will not be too boring, if it was not boring enough by now. So, to this CFT, you know why? Because uh, it is, of course, used for to describe the worksheet of your perturbative string, and also for, for example, ADS3 CFT2 duality. Okay, I will mostly stick to the worksheet uh, understanding of to this CFT. Okay, so we all know that. Uh, so what I mean is, so it's a two-dimensional uh, quantum field theory on Euclidean. So I will only do Euclidean two-dimensional conformal field theory with conformal symmetry. So this means that, uh, of course, if you have conformal transformations, are transformation of this kind such that the metric gets transformed by some rescaling, which might depend on the point, okay? So these are conformal transformations in, every, in any dimensions. In 2D, is much easier, uh, I mean, Conformal uh, symmetry is much more powerful, okay? So it com it's convenient in 2D to, to go to complex dimensions. And then uh, you take a metric, 
standard Euclidean metric on your uh, space time. And then uh, conformal transformations just correspond to transformations that are holomorphic in this complex variable Z. Okay. So if you want uh, infinite, if you have infinitesimal transformation, this is just Z uh, minus some infinitesimal thing, and you can expand the infinitesimal part in powers of Z if you want. So let me expand it like that. Okay. Sum over n power of z. It's convenient to put the z n plus one, and then I have some parameters epsilon n that tells me what kind of conformal transformation I have. And the same thing you can do on the uh, on the complex conjugate uh, variable. So this is this is just first order transformation. Then you have a higher order. The, se the same thing you can do here, and in conformal field theory, it's convenient to have, uh, to keep z and z bar as if they were independent variables, not the complex conjugate of each other. So you do all calculation as independent variables, and just at the end, you just uh, uh, require that they are the complex conjugate of each other. So the generators, so what this means is that you have infinitely many generators of conformal transformation to dimensions which correspond to these infinitely many parameters that they can put here and here, okay? So you have some vectors, some generators, some vectors that generate your conformal transformation which are like these. These are the one associated to this epsilon n parameters and then you have ln bar which is the one associated to the z bar parameters. And these guys obey some algebra which is called the Witt algebra. So I could get M and then standard. So this is M minus N L M plus N. Okay. So this is the commutation relation between these two guys. You have the same commutation relation between the L bar and then the L and L bar commute with each other. Okay. So this is essentially conformal transformation at classical level. And then if you go to the quantum level, at each of these generators, you get uh, an operator, okay, a LN, and the same for the LN bar. And the algebra they obey is essentially the same, except that it is a central extension of this algebra. So this is called the Witt algebra. And, and this is the well known Virasora algebra, where you get the same thing up to a certain term. Okay. So you get a central extension by a term like this, so a proportional to m, m square minus one, and it only appears where the two guys are opposite to each other, and this c is just uh, something that commutes with everything, so it's a number, essentially, and this is called the central charge. So this, I think, is well known to all, all everyone in this room, but just to, so this is the Virasor. And then you have another copy of this Virasor algebra, and the two copies commute. And the central charges usually are the same, but they don't need to be the same. Okay, they can be different. So this is the first basic thing about CFT. The other basic thing about CFT that I need, and then I just will use things, is the state operator correspondence. Okay. So let's say that you put your uh, two-dimensional Euclidean CFT on a cylinder. So something like S1 times R, which makes sense if you are doing closed string theory, right? So you have your closed string propagating. So you can say that this direction is like Euclidean time direction, and then you have the space direction, if you want, which is periodically identified. So let's call W, this time the complex combination of these two guys. And then, because you are a 
on a cylinder, then you have to identify W with W plus I, let's say I two pi. Okay. Okay, now if you are in a quantum theory, okay, so you interpret x0 as your time, and then you want to define, for example, a space of states at fixed time. Okay, so you call it H space of states on the circle at some, okay, at fixed time. And uh, so if this is a unitary theory, this is a Hilbert space. That's why I call it H, okay? And then you can, you might want to compute things like uh, amplitudes. For example, you, you might want to put an initial uh, in state, okay, in the circle at time minus infinity, some out state in the circle at plus infinity, and then you want to compute the transition amplitude, maybe with insertion or some local operators, okay, on the, on the cylinder. So that's kind of things that you might want to compute in your conformal field theory. And now the thing is that So the nice thing about this is that you have a conformal transformation from the cylinder, the infinite cylinder, okay, to the complex plane without the origin, okay? And this conformal transformation is given by defining z as e to the w. So this is e to the x0 times e to the i x1, okay? So this maps, this guy to the complex plane uh, without the origin. So if this is the origin, so what you see is that um, if you fix x1, so you have a line, uh, x1 fixed, okay? This becomes a line getting out of the origin. So these are fixed space lines that travel in time. And then fixed time, Circles become circle around the origin. Okay. So this is standard conformal transformation. So the nice thing about this is that uh, whatever state you put here in the circle at times minus infinity, okay, the circle at times minus infinity gets mapped just to a point here. Okay. So this means that whatever you put here, it should be it should be possible to describe it in this picture here, which is conformally equivalent to that, okay, just as a small, as a local perturbation at the origin, okay. So this gives you a correspondent within the possible initial states that you can put here and the operators that you can put at the origin, okay. okay so we have a correspondence between the space of states and the oper local operators. And this correspondence go, goes both ways, in the sense that any per local perturbation that you put in this picture, you should be able to describe, to describe somehow with some state that you put at minus infinity. And the same actually holds at plus infinity. So at plus infinity, that corresponds to the point at infinity here, okay? So if you add, so instead of looking at C minus the origin, you look uh, really at the Riemann sphere, okay? Then you can look at the Riemann sphere with some perturbation at the origin, some perturbation at the, at the infinity, and this is conformally equivalent to this, to this picture here. So all these guys you can compute equivalently in this picture here, and they are correlation functions on the Riemann sphere, okay? So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. This, is, this holds not just in two dimensions, this is more general in conformal theory, okay? So this H, is at the same time the space of states and the space of local operators in your theory, okay? And the way the correspondence work is that if you have a state phi in your space of states, you can identify the state with the, a corresponding operator, which I call with the same name, okay? Uh, acting, say, on the vacuum state, okay? 
and the state I want to put the, this operator on uh, at the origin of your complex plane. Okay, so this state you obtain by acting on the vacuum with an operator uh, at the origin. Okay, and in this correspondence, so the so this means that this state here corresponds to the, this operator here. Okay, and you see that the vacuum state corresponds to the uh, identity operator that does nothing. Okay, in this correspondence. Right. So when you do these conformal transformations, you have also a correspondence between, for example, the Hamiltonian on the cylinder. So I have S1 and SAR. I have a correspondence between. Uh, so the Hamiltonian on the cylinder essentially gives a, is a generator of translation in the Euclidean time, let's say. So in C minus the origin, Euclidean time is the radial direction. So translation in Euclidean time on the cylinder gets translated into dilatations with respect to the origin, okay? And what is the generator of dilatations? Well, the generator of dilatations is actually, uh, if you look at the classical guys, is actually L0 and L0 bar, okay? These are the generators of dilatation. Okay, because it's Z, uh, minus Z, the Z is the, are the generators of dilatation. So more precisely, the sum, so at the quantum level is the operator given by the sum over zero and L zero bar. Okay, and translation operator on the cylinder, that gets mapped to rotation. Okay, and the rotation operator is the difference of L0 and L0 bar, okay? So I have this translation between the different operators. So if one wants to be more careful, actually, this is not completely true, okay? Because of this central charge here. So this central charge is a little mismatch in this, in this correspondence. So I don't want to go into details, but this is not exactly this doesn't exactly correspond to this generator here. You have to add a, a, a central term, which is something, something like this. And actually the same is true here if the central charges are not the same on the left and on the right. Okay, this is, this is the, the right thing. And if you want even to be more general, if instead of making the identification into pi, you make an identification with a circle of length L here. Then here you also get a factor, which is something like two pi over L. Okay, this is more general. Okay, so it's something like this. So for these reasons, so what you are really interested in are uh, the L0 and L0 bar eigenvalues of our, for, for what we have to do, <laughs> the L0, L0 bar eigenvalues of the different states in the, uh, in the space of states, okay? So these are the really important guys. So I call them, I give them a name. So I call them, I usually denote them with H and H bar. These are the L0, L0 bar eigenvalues. Okay, of the value, so you can decompose the space of states into uh, eigenspaces for L0 and 0 bar, so that's the same as, you know, uh, energy eigenspaces and momentum eigenspaces in the cylinder, okay? And H and H bar are the L0, L0 bar eigenvalues of a given state, and this, uh, this is what they call conformal weights. So in, on the cylinder, these guys tell you are exactly energy and momentum. Uh, on C, they are uh, the spin, okay, because this is generator of rotations, and this is the conformal dimension that gives you the generator of uh, um, dilatations, okay. So in a unitary theory, so you can do also, you can also check non-unitary theories if you are in the Euclidean, but most of, most of the time we will look at the unitary theories. So unitarity puts some constraints on all of this, 
So first of all, the central charges must be greater or equal than zero, okay? So this is necessary to get a positive definite uh, inner product of your Hilbert space of states. And they also tell you that H and H bar must be greater or equal than zero. Okay. So in general, you could have a, a continuum spectrum and other kind of things, but I will only, cons most of the time, I will consider CFTs that have only discrete spectrum. So these are compact CFTs. They are sometimes called so only discrete spectrum. Okay. These are compact CFTs because uh, they're called compact CFTs because um, they arise where you have, uh, if you think in string theory, okay, where you have your string moving on a compact manifold. So the CFT describing the string moving in a compact manifold as discrete spectrum. If the manifold is not compact, then you have a continuum. Okay, that's what that answers. Okay. And the other thing is that uh, the vacuum state is the only state that has uh, both conformal weights equal to zero. Okay. So L0 and L0 bar is equal to zero. Okay, and that's the only, the unique state that has these properties. Okay. Right. So this is all, I think, well known by all of you. Now, what I want to tell you is the following. So I want to take an approach. So if you have a quantum field theory, you might be used to, you know, have things like uh, some fundamental fields, and then you have an action, and then you want to, uh, derive, calculate everything given an action, maybe doing perturbative things, etc. So that's not the way <laughs> I, I mean, you can do in some cases this thing in conformal field theory, but that's not the most powerful way to work in conformal field theory. So one of the ways to work in conformal field theory is to take advantage of symmetries. So, so you have an infinite set of generators of conformal symmetry, which is the Virasoro algebra. Okay, but very often actually you get extended symmetries. So let me say how these extended symmetries pop out. So let me say, first of all, how the Virasoro algebra pop out. So the Virasoro algebra is related to some uh, um, transformation of your uh, space-time into dimension. So it's related to a stress energy tensor, essentially. Okay. So it's a, all conserved currents you can reconstruct from the stress energy tensor in two dimensions. So you can take uh, the stress energy tensor to be, uh, to be symmetric, okay? This is not obvious if you obtain it from, from uh, Nether theorem, but you can take it as, it as this. And then conformal symmetry. So now mu and nu, if you use complex coordinates, can be uh, zz, z bar, z bar, or zz bar. Okay, and then conformal symmetry implies that the z z bar component is zero. Okay. And actually it's essentially two way thing okay. uh, with some conditions. That's essentially two way thing. So you have only the two components which is the z z component and the z bar z bar component and then concert your conservation of currents, what they tell you is that the ZZ component, so actually the uh, conservation equations look like this. Okay. So this tells you that the ZZ component is holomorphic. Okay. So it's a function of only Z. And the Z bar, Z bar component is anti-holomorphic. So I, I denote it Let's say T twiddle, okay. So this is a standard thing. So when I write T of Z, I mean the ZZ component of the stress tensor, and this is the Z bar, Z bar component. So since it is holomorphic, you can do a Lorana expansion of this guy, especially if you are working on C minus the origin, right? And if you do the Lorana expansion of this guy, then it's useful to get, to use this kind of expansion, and then the modes, 
appear, the operators that appear here in the Lorangus function are just the generators of your Pirasol algebra. And the same with the anti-holomorphic side. Okay. okay, and this gives you the other copy of the Pirasol algebra. So the, these guys are just the modes of your, uh, of your algebra, of your stress tensor, and then the algebra that they obey is related to what happens when you move two stress tensors very close to each other together. So this gets, this is what is called the op operator product expansion. So you can expand this product inside the correlation function where you move Tz sufficiently close to zero, okay? You can expand this in a, in a series in Z and then uh, what you get is something like Z over Z to the four and plus some other stuff, okay? So this tells you essentially that what the algebra is, okay? Now, you can generalize all of this. So everything I said now, you can actually generalize. So you can take, it often, it often happens that the algebra of symmetry is larger than just conformal symmetry. So you have conformal symmetry generated by all these guys, which are related to the stress tensor, which is uh, holomorphic, anti-holomorphic. But then you can have a larger symmetry, and you have a larger symmetry essentially every time that in your conformal field theory you have some holomorphic fields, okay? So every time, your conformal field theory emits some holomorphic fields. Let's call them phi of z, okay? So they obey the bar of phi uh, equals zero, okay? Then you can, these are essentially, you can interpret these as some kind of uh, um, conservation of a current, conservation law for some current, and the modes of these holomorphic fields are uh, generate a larger symmetry, generate some symmetry. So this Tz and Tz twiddle are the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic fields corresponding to the conformal symmetry. So this somehow generalize your Tz, okay? And then you have the same thing if you want with anti-holomorphic fields and this uh, extend your uh, anti-holomorphic virasol algebra. So being holomorphic from the point of view of the field is equivalent. So remember that every field has a corresponding state, okay, which I can denote with phi, is equivalent to the fact that L0 bar of phi of phi is zero. Okay. Well, usually this cannot be zero because the only state with zero here is the, is the vacuums, but I can take it as to have some definite conformal weight, okay? So holomorphic fields are satisfied this, this kind of thing. And then you can decompose your holomorphic fields into modes, okay, in Laurent modes. And the standard, so I call phi n, the Laurent modes, okay, times z to the minus n. And so there is a, a standard convention here for the mode numbering where here you put the conformal weight, okay? So what happens is that all this phi n essentially generate an algebra similar to the Virasol algebra, but can be much bigger, okay? And you can use this as an algebra of symmetry to constrain your, your correlation functions, okay? So the algebra generated by all holomorphic fields in your theory is what is called the chiral algebra. This is the algebra generated, if you want the algebra generated by the modes of your holomorphic fields, and then you have an anti-chiral algebra, which might be isomorphic or might not be isomorphic, which is generated by the anti-holomorphic. Okay, so the chiral algebra always contain Virasoro, but Virasoro is really the minimal thing. It can be, it can be large. And also the anti chiral algebra contains Virasoro, but can be, can be much larger, okay? So from a, 
So this is the place where you have a, a really mathematical formalization of your conformal field theory because this chiral algebra is essentially, uh, this has been axiomatized if you want and this becomes what is known as vertex operator algebra in mathematics. Okay, this is essentially the same thing in the sense that this is a way to axiomatize uh, what the chiral algebra is, okay? And so I should say that two-dimensional conformal field theories are, in a sense, the quantum field theories that are, or among the quantum field theories that are closest to uh, a rigorous axiomatic definition. So there are various approaches, a couple of approaches at least. One is through vertex operator algebras. So you look at the chiral algebra, so vertex operator algebras, and then look at the representations of vertex operator algebras, and then you try to build your CFT starting from this point. And then there are some other approaches, for, for example, through uh, conformal nets of observables, okay, which is a, another like rigorous approach to, to conformal field theory. And essentially, uh, almost all, I think, the statements that people do, the physicists do for conformal field theories can be proved in one or the other axiomatic setup. Um, but it's not clear that the two guys are <laughs> equivalent, or, or probably they're not. And <laughs> so there is no single setup where you can prove everything. So, <laughs> so you have to uh, a bit play with this thing. So the approach to conformal field theory that I take here is the following. So which data you want to give to define your conformal field theory? I want, to, I want you to give me the chiral algebra of your conformal field theory. Let's denote it by curly A. And maybe you have an antichiral algebra, which is uh, curly A bar, okay? Which might not be isomorphic, might be different guys in principle, okay? And then if you have these chiral algebras of your holomorphic fields, then the space of states, H, decomposes into representations of the chiral algebras, okay? So, what you get is that the space of states decomposes into representations of the chiral algebra A, tensor representations of the anti-chiral algebra A bar. Okay. And then you have a sum over all possible representations. Let's say that these are irreducible representations and then you have to put some multiplicities here okay, of your irreducible representations. So the way, and the way you build it, these representations is uh, similar for Virasora and for other, uh, for other algebras. So I, I will always take so-called, uh, let me call them lowest weight, or you can call them a highest weight, depending on which, how you look at them. So what you do is you take one state, okay, let's say for Virasora, you take one single state, uh, and for example, you want to build a, a representation for the holomorphic Virasoro algebra. So you take uh, one state H, okay? I call it H, which is, and you assume that it is killed by LN for all positive N. Okay, you start with this guy, and it is eigenstate of L0 with uh, eigenvalue H, okay? So this is, this is what you would call a, um, so this is a, a lowest weight state for your, uh, for your Virasoro algebra and the corresponding field, I don't know how to call it, let's call it Psi of H this time. The corresponding field is what you call the conformal primary, if you want. And then starting from this, state, uh, you just build all your representation by acting with the uh, negative modes. Okay, so L minus one to some K one, L minus two to some K two, etc. Okay, and you build all your representation in this way. And then, so what happens because of the algebra, or of the Virasoro algebra, if the if this guy has conformal weight H, 
Every time that you act with L minus one, you raise the conformal weight by one. Every time that you act with L minus two, you raise the conformal weight by two. So this has conformal weight uh, H plus K1 plus 2K2 plus et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you start from H and then you have all states with higher conformal weight. So that means that this is the state with the lowest conformal weight in your representation. So these are representations of your virus or algebra. You have to be a bit careful because some linear combinations of this guy might be zero <laughs> in your CFT, okay? So modulo this, this kind of things, but this is essentially a representation. And you can play the same game with these guys. Okay, you play exactly the same game. So instead of taking a lower state, which is killed by all positive virus oro, you, you, you take some lower state, let's call it lambda this time, which is killed by all the positive modes of all holomorphic fields in your chiral algebra. And then you might have many uh, zero modes in your chiral algebra. So you try to diagonalize your zero modes. So you try to take lambda to be an eigenstate for your zero modes. Of course, this works as long as the zero modes commute. So what you do is you take a lar the largest commuting set of your zero modes and you just diagonalize that. So you choose the largest commuting set and you diagonalize this guy, okay? So this is what you did. And then, and then you build your representation by acting with the negative modes on this guy in various ways. Uh, and here you can have phi i, phi j, because maybe you have different, you might have different holomorphic fields here acting, so you want them to all positive modes to kill and all negative to, to act. So you act in all positive ways, and this way you, you build your representation. And again, the mode numbering here, the reason why we choose this mode numbering is essentially that the conformal weight is raised by uh, one or by two or whatever mode numbering you have here. So this, this means that this lambda are always the guys with the the lowest, the lowest conformal weight. So in principle, actually, okay, if, if the zero modes don't commute, in principle, you should also act with the zero modes here to get all the guys, okay, a representation of the zero modes. Right. So these are the, the representations. So you build a representation like that, you tell me, you decompose the spectrum in this kind of representations. And then, so you have to tell me which representations are contained there. And then the only piece of information that one needs is uh, uh, what happens with the three-point functions of primary fields, primary operators, where primary operators are the operators corresponding to this uh, lowest weight guy, okay? So once I know these things, three-point functions of the primary operators, Okay, so I know the chiral algebra, what the representations are in the, in, the, in the theory and the three point functions of the primary operators. Then from these, using symmetries, I can reconstruct uh, all correlation functions in my two dimensional conformal field theory. So uh, I know essentially everything about my conformal field theory. So I don't need an action, I don't need to, I don't need to specify what are the fundamental fields in my theory because these local operators, you know, might not be different fundamental fields. You know, if you write in terms of fundamental fields, might be derivatives, higher derivatives of the same field or uh, regularized products of fields in the same point or things like that. But it doesn't matter. You just think of them as local operators and, and this is how you be. So I will always think of CFT in these terms here. Okay. So I think I'm, uh, I'm done. So I will continue tomorrow. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Now you. Yeah, I, yeah. It's not completely obvious, the translation, but these are like um, twisted representations of chiral algebras, for example. So that, that kind of corresponds to, to defect operators. Yeah, uh, yeah. So twisted, yeah, in a sense, in, a, in, a, in the right sense. Okay. So they are, yeah. So it depends on what your defect preserves. So usually your defect preserves a subalgebra of the chiral algebra. And then the defect operators fall into representation of the preserved subalgebra. But then they act somehow on the whole algebra, maybe in, in a non-invertible way. <laughs> okay, but uh, they act somehow and then this kind of correspond to having a twisted representation of your of your larger algebra. That's a good question. So I, I, so in the old moonshine, uh, they don't. Yeah, it depends on what you. I mean, you can describe the old moonshine in terms of defects, okay, of invertible defects, okay, and this helps somehow actually to find, for example, the phases in the modular transformations, okay, because these are. I mean, you can interpret these phases as like anomalies in your uh, uh, Toft anomalies in your global group, or you can you can think of the group as being invertible defects, and then the categorical uh, the fusion category that they generate that's that's the that gives you the phases essentially. So you you can give this interpretation, and that's kind of easier to understand how these things are related to modular properties because then you have the defect inserted. <laughs> on the torus, maybe I, I will say something actually tomorrow about this. You have a defect inserted on the torus, and then you have, if you have more defects, then they have to join in a certain way, and then when you do a conformal transformation, you see how they, they move, and then you have to make things like half transforms to, to bring them back to the previous configuration, and that might bring up some, I mean, that depends on the structure of your, of your category, not just, so these things. But non-invertible defects, I haven't seen, I th uh, because they were not used <laughs> at the time, but I think they could play a role, even maybe in new moonshines. That's my kind of hope <laughs> in this direction. Yeah, that would be interesting to, to, to check. Maybe I can, I can get the link of this thing.